Here's the popular image of drinking. Fun, romantic, sexy. For our entire lives, we've been exposed to various forms of this image. On TV, at the movies, and especially in ads and commercials. It's become a sort of cultural propaganda. But here is the long-term effect of alcohol on people, a more realistic and accurate vision to keep in mind. Take a close look at your local town drunk someday. It's best to see alcohol as the poison it is, and once you begin to see it that way, then the mere sight or mention of it will produce an instant aversion in your mind. This principle of instant aversion short circuits desire. When you honestly try it, you will see. A stark, repulsive view of alcohol is necessary to counteract the effects of the cultural propaganda we've been exposed to since childhood. Drinkers make excuses and rationalize their drinking. We may never drive drunk, miss work, or get in trouble. We may be functional, but we function below peak level. And that's the important thing to admit and to rectify. Confirmation bias occurs when we ignore the millions of people whose health was ruined by alcohol and focus instead on a few who drank until they were over 90. When our actions conflict with our principles, we have cognitive dissonance. We know drinking is unhealthy and yet claim to live a healthy lifestyle. That's a contradiction. To get out of it, we naturally minimize the bad effects of alcohol. But in order to quit, we must do the exact opposite and magnify its bad effects in our own mind. Even the words disease and addiction act like little enablers because they excuse drinking as somehow involuntary. If you do something involuntarily, there's no blame and therefore no shame. But taking the shame out of drinking does the drinker a disservice because shame has a valid function. It regulates our conduct. Doctors and hospitals have a definite financial incentive to classify drinking as a disease because diseases are covered by insurance. Contrary to popular belief, many long-time drinkers will experience no withdrawal symptoms after they stop, and even DTs end in a couple of days under a doctor's care, so fear of them is no excuse to keep drinking. Drinking alcohol is not our natural default position, so don't act like it is. Shift the burden of proof to alcohol to prove itself. We don't have to prove it's toxic as much as it has to prove it's worth losing sobriety for, which it can't. There's a reason why our body removes it from our system when we sleep. Thus, the real question becomes not why quit, but why start again each day. After a drink, we're always a bit impaired, which can lead to disaster. We 
may feel uneasy before taking a drink and expect it to make us feel better, but it eventually won't. It's ultimately a failed experiment, a bad guess at what will satisfy. Look how angry and incapable drunks are. When it comes to finding happiness, the shortest road becomes the longest. life experience we've learned that happiness comes from the honest satisfaction that flows from doing what we should do and doing it well, not from some noxious chemical any fool can take. drink we trade long-term satisfaction and health for short-term gratification. The psychologist warns us that the ego can be confused with the self, leading to self-destructive, ego-driven behaviors. An accomplished actor who quit drinking said this about himself and about those who drink. teetotaler knows no more facts about alcohol than the local town drunk does. He just sees them in a different way, as this set of lines can be seen either as a duck or a rabbit by turns. This drawing proves that when you change what you see things as, the things themselves seem to change. Thus you can start to see alcohol as a poison if you try. Remember that alcohol killed John Bonham and the son of Ted Koppel and Samantha Spady. And when you were a kid, you always knew it was no good when you saw older people drunk. Some people will encourage you to drink. They'll say, one drink won't kill you, but that's the wrong way to look at it. A little ammonia or arsenic won't kill you either. So what? That's a feeble argument for drinking it. The important fact is that it won't help you. And having one drink at a party is a bad idea because it spoils your vision of alcohol as a poison. Just remember that you wouldn't drink any amount of Windex at a party. Trying to have fewer drinks or fewer drinking days has a hidden negative effect. It inflates the importance of drinking, which creates a positive vision of alcohol, the exact opposite of what you need. And when you see drinking as a special treat, you will drink more eventually by either adding to your number of drinks or drinking days. So instead of trying to cut down, you're better off avoiding alcohol completely.
Feeling bad about the drinks you can't have only undermines your sobriety. Instead, give yourself positive reinforcement for not drinking. A famous athlete said the following. He gives himself positive feedback, but don't expect any from people who drink, who may feel challenged by your sobriety and belittle it. So don't look for their support, nor for a pat on the back. The word sober can be an obstacle to quitting because it implies that we are doing without but those who drink are doing without their full potential, their full strength and peak abilities. And after a few drinks, even writing a letter is risky because our judgment is impaired. And alcohol makes us more belligerent, but less able to fight, a dangerous combination. And if an emergency arose after we had a few drinks and we had to drive someone to the hospital, we might make things worse. As soon as you stop drinking alcohol, Drink plenty of juice, tea, coffee, or sparkling water, preferably from your old beer or wine glass, so you won't feel as if you're missing anything or that your routine has changed. This makes the transition smooth. The only changes are invisible. Many people have moved beyond sober to a new life where alcohol has no place, where it brings instant aversion and offers no more temptation than a bottle of bleach. It's lumped together with the cleaning products under the sink. These people are busy with other things and they can become your new peer group. A sense of belonging with them makes avoiding alcohol easier still. Three thousand years ago, King Solomon wrote, Do not gaze at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup. Thus he knew the importance of avoiding a dangerous, seductive vision. These twelve reminders are the logical complement to that ancient text. They create instead a repulsive vision of alcohol that works on our behalf. Making the case against alcohol has been a vital challenge for centuries. Eventually, we must all do it for ourselves. These reminders will help.